All right, why don't we go ahead and get started because um, uh, uh, we have a pretty busy agenda today. So thank you again for joining us. Um, welcome uh, to the second day of the CNI um, Spring uh, 2022 uh, member meetings virtual. moderating through the sessions uh, as we go through the day. Um, just a couple of quick notes on things. We are doing this as a um, Zoom meeting rather than a webinar, which means that you can see the other people at the uh, who are um, at the uh, session, and uh, you can um, uh, chat with them as either with direct messages or to everybody as you wish. I invite you to um, uh, comment on uh, along, ask questions in the chat as we go. Um, uh, we will be having uh, uh, quest. We will be taking questions at the end of each uh, presentation, time permitting. I've also, like I did yesterday, um, asked a couple of uh, folks to share some brief reflections at the end of the day. Um, uh, just a few comments on things they found particularly interesting or exciting or surprising. So after um, the closing invited session with uh, Marissa Parham, um, you can look forward to a couple of those before we end the meeting. Uh, we will be um, having two short breaks, one at two um, uh, daylight time and one at 3.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, between the breaks, um, uh, I'll just end one session and introduce, uh, I'll, I'll end one presentation and introduce the next um, at the appropriate time. So we'll just flow right in. During the breaks, we will leave the session running so you don't have to log out and log back in again. And that's about all the logistical stuff I want to say. So now let me get on to uh, to the uh, me the meeting itself. It is a very great pleasure for me to introduce Heidi Fraser Krauss. Heidi um, has a really rich um, uh, and varied career in academia um, in the UK, and I invite you to look at her full bio. Um, she came to JISC in um, late, uh, late um, 2021 um, from the University of Sheffield. Uh, before that, she was at York um, York University for quite a long time and, among other things, um, had responsibility for research computing and for libraries at various times during her, um, during her stint at York. Um, she takes up uh, office at a very critical time where there's a lot of change going on in UK higher education. Um, and UK higher education, as I think she'll at least touch on, is quite different than in structure than, uh, than the US, but does many of the same things and faces many of the same challenges. Uh, JISC has been a important partner to CNI for a quarter of a century now. Um, I've uh, had the privilege of working closely with JISC leadership um, for many years, and um, it's a great pleasure to now uh, be able to um, work with Heidi and uh, learn from her uh, and uh, gain insights into uh, good ideas that we can uh, bring to the United States from the UK. Uh, Heidi's going to talk for about um, 20 minutes, I think, and then um, hopefully we'll have a few minutes to field a couple of questions. So over to you, Heidi. Thank you so much for being with us, um, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your remarks. Thank you very much, Cliff. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, greetings from Manchester in the United Kingdom. It's about five o'clock here, so I've, I've done part of my day. Right, um, JISC. I'm going to tell you a bit about the history of JISC, where it's come from, um, what it's doing, and where it's going. 
about 20 minutes. I'll skip through some of the slides very quickly because there's detail on them, but I'm very happy to answer questions at the end. Okay, so first of all, um, why does JUSC exist? It exists because it believes in technology for the good. It believes that education and research improve lives and that technology underpin that. So um, when I decided I was gonna apply for the JUSC job, this mission and the principles that JISC underpins or has as underpinnings was really important to me. So this vision for the UK to be world leaders in technology for education and research, really important. That's one of the reasons I joined um, the organization. Okay. Um, JISC has had an interesting history. Um, so the organization has existed for about 40 years in various different forms. Um, it started off with the Janet Network, which is our national research and education network. Um, and then just got funding from a government body to fund activities that were going on in various universities across the UK. And there was all sorts of interest came out of that. So there were people who were interested in cyber. There were people who were interested in mapping and mapping data. There were people who were interested in digital skills, um, technologies to support um, people with special needs, etc. Um, so just was a scattered body across the UK higher education um, sector with a sort of core body that funded these things. And in 2012, there was a review done that said um, we need just to be more coherent as an organization. And so all of those um, different services were brought into one. And that was, as you can imagine, fairly traumatic for the organization. It hadn't existed as one organization um, really before, but it was formed as a charity. Um, the Janet Network people, Janet, were brought in to JISC um, and an organization was formed. And I think I still see ripples of that um, fragmentation um, from back in 2012. We've also merged since with a number of other organizations, some of which may not be familiar to you, but some of which I'm sure you'll know the services they provide. So, for example, uh, EduServe um, gives the Open Athens uh, Trust and Identity Service and VerifID. And CHEST is something we um, have in the UK, which is around negotiating for big um, software deals. Um, so with the likes of Microsoft, Adobe, et cetera. And then the other ones are much more local to the, to the UK. So HESA is the Higher Education Statistics Agency. And we brought in their, um, the commercial side of um, that data organization. And we're in very advanced discussions about bringing the rest of that data organization into JISC now. Um, and then a little bit around about the same time, we also brought in an organization who provide careers advice um, and something called um, HEAD. So HEAD is a, a, an interesting service that's provided uh, in, to the UK, but also internationally, it's around degree uh, verification. So higher education degree verification. Um, so we've got a very broad um, scope of things that we do. Okay, we also have a very uh, interesting funders and owners model. So we are owned by the higher education and the further education sector um, in the UK. So further education, I think, would be community colleges, you'd call it that. And then we have other representative bodies from UK higher education. So something called Guild HE, which tends to be universities that are more practically focused. So, for example, drama or catering, those sorts of professional types of activities. And Universities UK, which is a body would I would say represents the rest uh, of universities. Um, we're funded by what I can only describe as um, a patchwork of funders. Um, lots of government funding coming in different slices from different organisations um, across the UK. Um, we do, uh, uh, strangely, not all bodies in the UK serve the whole of the United Kingdom. So by that, I mean Northern Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales. And you may think, uh, good Lord, the UK is so small. How can it have all of that fragmentation? But I can assure you there are lots of um, people who see themselves as very, very different when they're in Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland. OK, um, we serve the whole of JISC. We do. Uh, sorry, we serve the whole of the UK. Uh, lots of um, all state funded universities uh, are, mem are our members. 
the vast majority of colleges. We also supply services to schools, to research institutes um, and other national institutions. So for example, we work closely with people like the British Library, but also some other uh, research, um, sort of government research bodies, Diamond Light Source, etc. cetera. Um, and we also work very closely, the UK has a number of, of national um, or sector bodies, we call them. So um, Advance HE is around staff development in higher education um, and governance, uh, et cetera, also does gender equality, um, et cetera. UCAS is our admission service into university. So we have a centralized admission service um, in the UK and the NCSC is the National Cybersecurity Center. And you can imagine we work fairly closely with them too. Um, just a few statistics there in terms of um, number of staff, um, research members, et cetera. And there's our income in pounds. And I'll go into a little bit more detail there. So in terms of our income, as I've already mentioned, we get money from UK funding bodies. We also get um, a lot of income from digital resources licensing, but that's mainly passed through in that we will do a deal on behalf of um, the sector, the higher education sector for, for example, Elsevier. Uh, materials and we will do the deal we'll pay, pay Elsevier and the sector will pay us back um, for that so just a sort of an overview there in terms of expenditure um, e-infrastructure so by that we mean our uh, national research and education network Janet um, takes up majority of our funding and that is also um, has a cyber offering as part of it and then you can see there's other bits and pieces um, just a few things I'll nip through around what we do, the services we offer, they're fairly broad. The thing we're best known for is our connectivity, um, the network I keep talking about, Janet. So that is a resilient, uh, very high capacity um, network um, that's used by all of higher and further education. Obviously, the higher bandwidth used by the research institutions. We have about 18 million users and lots of other statistics around that, around how many peerings we have, that's important um, to keep the UK well connected. Cybersecurity, you won't be surprised uh, to see on the list. Um, we've done an awful lot of work around this space um, to protect the UK. Um, we offer a number of services that come as part of our subscription, but we also offer paid for services um, that our members buy. So for example, penetration testing is something that we, we offer. And you can see there, we've had a 40% increase in people asking us to do penetration tests for them. Um, and we've also launched something we call a managed seam. So a security incident, incident event management service. Um, so we're moving more and more into that territory of offering services in partnership with um, commercial organizations. Licensing, um, again, is another area. If you said JISC, everybody would know um, what we were talking about here. Um, so we do those, those big negotiations around um, content, so scholarly content, but also, again, moving more and more into um, software now. Customers are saying, you know, we're looking for you to, to get involved with those big deals. And one of the things that's been quite interesting recently that we've done uh, deals on is around virtual reality. Um, packages, augmented reality uh, for teaching and learning purposes um, and for research to a degree, but mainly for teaching and learning purposes. Um, we save the sector a lot of money um, by doing those um, deals and um, more or less all uh, institutions participate in our agreements. We're also heavily involved um, in open research. This is something that um, our funder Research England is particularly keen on um, around open science. So um, the negotiations that we've been doing more recently with um, Elsevier um, have had an open access component to them very firmly in there. And you'll see that we are um, fairly well ahead in the UK with um, open access um, to content. When we've finished the Elsevier deal, we reckon we'll be up around the 80% mark, um, which is considerably ahead of others. We're also interested in not just um, scholarly content, but also metadata, algorithms, code, software, the whole nine yards um, to support that open research agenda, which we know is very important. Um, we also do um, some work around data analytics. We have a data analytics service, um, which we have been running in a about 20 institutions, we call it learning analytics. 
Um, I'm sure that's a, a topic that's uh, discussed over in the, in the States. And this thing there, Heidi Plus, that is actually nothing to do with me. Um, that is actually a, um, a product that HESA, the Higher Education Statistics Agency, offer. And that's basically, it's a very interesting biz business model we have in the UK. Um, institutions have to be um, members of HESA and they have to give them their data to receive government funding. And what HESA does is uh, packages that up and sells it back. Um, so it's quite an interesting business model. It's a bit like the, uh, the academic publishing model um, there. Um, but it means that universities can get data um, about all sorts of things. So who's on, you know, not, not down to individual level, but numbers of people on courses they can benchmark um, against other institutions. They can look at the size of the market for courses, et cetera. And there's a couple of other things I won't touch on for uh, value of time, but they're around um, data, the provision of data. Cloud, we also offer cloud services and we offer consultancy. We have um, a member of the OCRA framework, which is something that happens in, the, in, the, in Europe. Um, it's a deal basically with um, Amazon Web Services and others, and lots of institutions have taken us up on that and are saving considerable amounts of money. We are supporting members in moving things to the cloud. Um, but that's been a slow burn uh, in the UK. Maybe the pandemic will have accelerated some of that, but not everybody is there on that one yet. And we will be working more um, on that in future. Verification services. Um, so Open Athens, I've already mentioned, um, and we run the UK Access Management Federation based on Shibboleth, um, which I'm pretty sure you'd be familiar with in, in the US. And then again, we do things on behalf of the sector. Um, so savings for certificates for, um, for the internet type of security certificate piece. Uh, we do on bulk and support universities with that. And we also do, you'll see there about bogus universities. We also do work around, you know, what is a university? What is a valid university? And help spot those who are selling on um, bogus degrees, basically. So quite an interesting, a very broad range of things. Um, I'll skip on because I know time is, is, uh, is marching on. We do some work with students. Uh, we're mainly a B2B uh, business, but we also have some B2C things. Um, so we do a digital experience survey for students, um, digital experience insight survey. And I did check this figure of 74 million views of that um, in, in 1920. The reason it got so many views is it because it went in one of our tabloid newspapers with some of the results around that. And <laughs> So it was the Daily Mail, for those of you who know what that is. And that got an awful lot of views <clears throat> on the survey. We also do um, have a range of tools. So building digital capability um, is something that is for an individual to be able to look at their um, digital skills and you get a rating and then um, sign points, uh, signposts to um, resources to help you improve your digital capability so that's used quite heavily across the UK and then prospects there is a uh, a job board that we run so we really do have a very broad a very broad range of things uh, content and discovery just owns some content um, and also helps people access some content so for the um, librarians in the, the group you'll see we help people access content the Archives Hub is another thing that we um, support. So um, institutions are able to put their um, archive content um, in our hub and it's therefore searchable by other people. So it's a sort of federated um, access piece. Um, and then just along there, you see FE is further education and we've been doing work around um, giving access to content, uh, ebook content for our um, further education colleagues. So lots and lots of things um, in that space. Um, we do some value. We have to make sure we are um, value for money and we do a number of value for money um, studies. So there's just one that I wanted to show you here which is the University of Cardiff. For those of you who don't know about the University of Cardiff, it's a large research intensive university, the biggest one in Wales, about 30,000 students. And we looked at um, the money that we saved them. So we looked at two particular areas, uh, a, a one on this one actually. Um, we looked at connectivity um, and how much JISC saved um, Cardiff by doing what it did. And you can see there's um, substantial savings um, and cost avoidance. 
I don't think I've got the slide in here. No, um, there is a slide around how much we saved um, Cardiff on content as well, and it was uh, millions of pounds um, over over numbers of years. So just skipping on to what my focus is over the next 12 months uh, for JISC. So obviously the network's very important. We will be and continuing to invest and re-architect that, making sure that it, it um, meets the needs of the research community. It's heavily dependent on. We have a very good uptime for Janet. So it's 99.97 uh, is our uptime. Um, people expect that. They expect that level of service and resilience, and we have to keep going with that one. We're also looking at other things that are coming down the track, so supporting 5G um, and how that might help um, campuses with um, access uh, for speeds, but also looking at whether they can move from having you know, a wireless infrastructure on the, in campus to moving to 5G, but all sorts of other things around that. And then, as I've already mentioned, um, managed services um, for members in partnership with um, commercial organisations. Um, more on cyber, you won't be surprised to see me saying that. Um, one of the things I'm working with is on institutions at a more senior level with traditionally just dealt with, not just dealt, but with dealt with librarian and um, CIO. I'm going the next level up and the level above that. So I'm looking at what we would call chief operating officer and um, vice chancellor level to really get them on board around what needs to happen around cybersecurity. Um, we've see, had a number of incidents in the UK around cyber and lots of the things need to be owned at executive team level, board level. Um, and so one of the things I've been doing is engaging at that level and just bringing across the importance of um, vice chancellor and chief operating officer ownership of that as a risk. Um, data, I've already mentioned, we're in advanced discussions with HESA, that won't mean much to you. Um, neither will um, USISA maybe, but um, what we are doing with, so USISA are our equivalent of EDUCORS um, in the UK. Um, we are working with them on student record systems. Um, I'm sure you have issues with that over in, in the States. We've got a very... Um, legacy systems in the UK, lots of problems around that. And we're working with USISA to understand what our members need uh, in that and also what GIST can do in that space. Um, and then looking at tackling um, SA mills. So the um, government in the UK is set to make SA mills illegal and GIST will play a part in um, blocking them. It's, a, it's been, become a big problem, particularly over the pandemic. Um, AI, we're going to be working on. Um, we see great potential in AI, but we're also very keen to make sure that what we do there is ethical. Um, other thing, UK focused, lifelong learning. Um, so again, the UK government is putting quite a lot of money into um, post-university education or even people who've not had, so people who can do learning along the whole of their lifetime from school onward. Um, obviously, to be able to do that, you've got to be able to have, you know, have a sort of way of managing the identity of people. So what courses have they actually taken? Um, the UK government's promised money behind that. How do you track the money? So we've been working on um, where we can play a part in that. We are also working on a project around sharing research um, in a different way to doing scholarly publication. Um, so again, this is something that we've been encouraged to do by one of our funders is to look at that model of, of how research findings or how the research process is, is managed. Um, and you know, at the moment, you, know, you release an article, a journal, scholarly journal, but there are other ways of doing that. And we're working on a project called Project Octopus. Um, which is in its early stages. And then the last thing you won't be surprised to hear is my focus is around looking at um, our sustainability and our carbon. Um, I had hoped that there would be things I could draw on already to advise members on. For example, you know, is it less carbon for us all to do video conferencing calls than travel into the office? How much embedded carbon is there in devices? You know, we send a lot of track traffic down networks, we store a lot of images, we store a lot of data, how much does that all cost in carbon? Um, I haven't been able to find anything. Uh, I went to our research um, funding bodies and asked them if they'd got anything. So we're, we've commissioned some research, which I'm sure will pull together things that are already available, but then we'll advise our members around the carbon piece. 
And that is it. I will stop sharing so you can ask me any questions and I can see some faces. Thank you so much for that um, whirlwind tour through. <laughs> Whistle stop, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Always, I'm always astounded by how many things um, Chisk is doing. Um, and uh, also the way you do it across the entire higher ed sector, which is something that is, you know, aside from internet too, there's not all that much that goes across the entire higher ed sector in the, uh, in the US. Um, please, um, let me open this up for, for questions uh, from, um, from those in attendance. I will note, uh, Heidi, that we did have an early presentation on octopus um, in one of our earlier meetings, um, and our following. I think we're following. We're all following that with great interest. Well, the team, interestingly enough, the team that are working on octopus are in the office I'm in today. They've all been had a screen up with lots of code and been going through, so that the project is definitely progressing. Great. Questions for Heidi. Ah. Do you want me to answer that one? So I'm um, not sure I, I can tell you much more than I've already told you, um, other than the project is now, you know, code has been cut. Mm -hmm. There are minimum, minimum viable products being developed. Uh, users are being engaged with. Uh, our members are being engaged with. And um, I can get more information. Yep, you probably you probably we, we know more put, than me. <laughs> we just put the link to the presentation from December in the in the chat for Irene. Um, other questions for Heidi. Um, I guess I, well while I'm while I'm waiting for people, um, I, I have one. I was very interested to hear about the growing commitment to cybersecurity services, incident response, and other kinds of things. I'm wondering um, if uh, one, one of the challenges we have in the States is that talent in this area, especially technical talent, is quite scarce and quite expensive. Are you finding this kind of um, service delivery model a good a good way to help your members uh, get some leverage on that? Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting um, question. So yes, one of the reasons that we are looking at that partnership model with third parties is that skills and resource piece. But I think it's also because I think we probably accept that we're not that good at running large scale services and we need partners to help us with that. But in terms of talent, we're in the same position as you. We've had the great resignation as well. Um, the whole of the UK has. And everybody is struggling for um, people with the cyber skills. We've not done too badly in JISC. We've just had a, a new round of um, recruitment for more junior staff. And we've now got a full complement. And we also have um, um, a grad scheme and an apprenticeship scheme in this space. So the, our focus is, is definitely around grow your own, but also keep the people that we've got. Um, we did have a number of people um, get pinched uh, by some of our suppliers, actually. So yeah, it's a challenge. Perhaps one more question for Heidi. Bamboozled you all with my slides, you yep. see. I think there, there's so much in there. Um, I hope you'll share those slides sure. so that we can make them available, by the way. All right. Well, I will um, I will thank you. I know it's late there. Um, I very much appreciate you joining us. I hope at some point you can come and be with us in person. Um, uh, and I look forward actually to... Uh, uh, seeing you in person um, and catching up sometime in the not too distant future, uh, pandemic willing. So <laughs> thank you very much. For coming. Really Enjoy the rest of your meeting. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.